good evening uh, to those who are joining us. Uh, my name is Josh Human at the Power Plant, and this is a field trip program uh, featuring artist Howie Choi and artist Greg Girard. Um, so we're just gonna wait for a few more people to join us, and then we'll get started with our uh, conversation. Uh, so again, my name is Josh Human. Uh, from the power plant in Toronto. Um, looking very much looking forward to chatting with uh, Howie Choi and Greg Girard in, uh, who are both in the Vancouver area. Um, so we're just gonna wait just a few more seconds and, uh, and then we'll, we'll be underway. So very good. Um, so a more formal introduction. Uh, my name is Josh Human. I'm the Curator of Education and Public Programs at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery in Toronto, uh, one of Canada's leading uh, galleries dedicated to exhibiting work by uh, living artists from Canada and around the world. Uh, I am really delighted uh, that the Power Plant is one of over 40 organizations across the country participating in field trip programs. Um, so for more information, if you don't already know, uh, please visit fieldtrip.art. Um, and of course, for any information about the power plant, the powerplant.org. Um, but uh, this evening, we are really delighted uh, to welcome Howie Choi, who uh, has an exhibition right now at the power plant, unfortunately closed to the public because of COVID-19. Um, but I am overjoyed to say that the exhibition will continue um, with slight modification uh, into our next season. Um, and also Greg Girard, a photographer uh, based in Vancouver, um, who, uh, whose work uh, will say um, relates very directly to uh, some of the work that Howie has made. So uh, um, the two know each other sort of in passing uh, as casual acquaintances. Um, and so we're, we're gonna get into it a little bit more. Um, so I'd really like to start Greg with you. And um, so I know that you're born and raised in Vancouver but you spent a significant portion of your uh, career in uh, Japan and China, um, including uh, photographing in the Kowloon-Walled City. So I just wonder, what is it that took you from Vancouver off to Japan and China? Um, I, my first trip was to uh, Hong Kong and Southeast Asia in, in 1974. And um, I mean, it was really just a far away place I, I wanted to go. I, I think I really wanted to put some distance between myself and home uh, for one thing. Um, but, um, you know, growing up in Vancouver, probably the most different part of the city was Chinatown. And that was a, you know, uh, kind of a, a go-to place to make some of my first pictures. Um, um, downtown Vancouver, um, Chinatown area was where I first started roaming around as a, you know, a teenager in high school. And um, that that had to have had some some sort of influence. I mean, none of this is exactly direct influence, but, you know, um, it, definitely it played a part in, in kind of shaping the idea of where to, you know, where to go if I was going to leave home. And um, so, I mean, 1974 in the summer, I made my first trip to Hong Kong and Southeast Asia and really liked Hong Kong and found reasons to continue going back there over the years. Um, I lived in Tokyo for a stretch, but um, ended up in Hong Kong on a trip in 1982 and ended up staying there for about 14 years. Great. And so then I wonder, you know, uh, as I understand it, the Kowloon Walled City um, outside of Hong Kong proper um, was sort of like this, this, um, what would he say, like a, a Franken building, <laughs> uh, it, you know, off off on the horizon, as it were. Um, well, it was actually right in the middle of Hong Kong. It was right in the middle of urban okay. Kowloon. It was very much a part of the the urban fabric of, of the city, uh, particularly in, in, in Kowloon. 
uh, very close to the airport uh, at, at Kai Tak, which was um, basically a runway sticking out into Kowloon Bay and the, the planes would have to make this incredible approach low over the city, making a hard right turn at about 200 feet and then straightening out and landing on the runway that sticks out into the bay. Um, I'd heard about it, um, never had met anybody who'd been there, but it, it was known by reputation as a, you know, a place parents tell their kids not to go. You know, it's um, dangerous. Um, the, the reputation was drugs, vice, crime. And that certainly all was part of the history of the place. But um, I mean, basically what it was was 300 interconnected high rise buildings in basically a city block surrounded by um, housing estates and other buildings, just the urban fabric of Kowloon. Because it was so close to the airport, um, all of Kowloon had a height restriction. So the tallest you could build a building was 13 stories. So the walled city, like everything else in those days up until the airport moved in 1998, topped out at 13 stories. Uh, I almost literally stumbled across it one night when I was photographing near Kai Tak Airport um, in about 1985. Um, came around a corner, saw this building thing, this Franken building is a good description <laughs> at the end of the block and um, realized that that had to be the Kowloon Walled City and then little by little started visiting and trying to make pictures there. And um, and so I wonder like, you know, overall, like how, how many, years how many how many adventures into the Kowloon Walled City did you make how many photographs oh, did you end up taking uh, many many thousands um, I mean I photographed there from about 1986 to 1990 mm -hmm. um, it was torn down in 1992 um, the last couple of years it was emptying out so it didn't have the same lived inness that it did uh, when I first came across it. And um, that just coincided um, shortly after I started going there with an announcement by the Hong Kong government that the place was going to be torn down and the population resettled. Um, so I, so I, I explored it. Yeah. For about four or five so years. I wonder, sort of like, what were, what were some of the challenges in photographing there? In, in the beginning, there was some kind of low level hostility to anyone with a camera because the place had gotten such a bad rap in the press in general. You know, it was the only time you, I mean, you just didn't read about it. It wasn't part of anybody, anybody's interest. I mean, it's astonishing, but no one cared about the place, you know? So um, um, the challenges were really um, just trying to convince people that I wasn't there to do a, a number on them and that I, you know, I, my intentions were, were good in the sense I, I wanted to show the place for what it was, you know, a community and um, living in this sort of ex physical extremis, you know, and um, I mean that from the beginning, that was the, my approach was that this place is so different than everything I've heard about it. You know, yes, it's kind of completely this kind of, monstrosity in one way but on the other hand it's this it's a huge village mm -hmm. with you know, everyone trying to do normal things yeah i mean a population yeah, of like people. about thirty thousand people at its yeah, about thirty five thousand people in yeah. a city block you know and i mean really it was just it was just this this huge distance between what it was and what its reputation was that i tried to bridge you know with yeah and so i wonder you know in in all of your ventures um into the Kowloon Walled City and your time spent there, did did you ever sort of experience or feel in danger or a risk? Did you have any heartwarming moments, any moments of connection? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was I wasn't looking for acceptance. I mean, I was looking really for indifference. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, just ignore me. Um, was like really a lot to hope for. And eventually I kind of got to that, you know? Um, but yeah, you know, I, you had to make, I won't go so far as to say 
friends, but I mean, people got to know me, you know, I mean, I was there pretty solidly for, you know, two or three years, very solidly and um, a little less towards the end. So, I mean, you know, I, I think any photographer who's going into a community, they don't belong, you know, it's all taking pictures is the easy part. The, the process is kind of, you know, trying to not get kicked out, you know, so. Right. Um, um, but, you know, people, people once they kind of understood what you were doing were, were totally okay. And there, there was never any, any danger there. I think there might've been um, earlier on, you know, before my time when it was more of a, a place that was controlled by the triads, you know, the, the, the gangs uh, and, you know, people went there for um, drugs, prostitution, gambling, um, you know, if you maybe strayed from mm -hmm. that customer base, you might have had some problems back. Just, we're talking about the 50s and 60s now. Right. By the time I started photographing there, all of that vice, so-called vice in Hong Kong was available everywhere and elsewhere. And any working class neighborhood had drugs available. So, you know, there yeah. are other places to go for those things. So I, at this stage, I'd love to I'd love to pull Howie into the conversation. Um, so Howie, you were born in Hong Kong. I think is Howie with us, or is he frozen? He may be frozen. Oh, there you are. Um, Am I working? Howie, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. I, okay. I had to run inside. I didn't know who's frozen, Greg or me. Okay. <laughs> so I wonder, Howie, um, so you were born in Hong Kong, um, spent some of your formative years in Lagos, Nigeria. Your family relocated to Thunder Bay, Ontario. Now you live and work in Vancouver, but travel when travel is possible. Um, so... Um, Maybe tell us a little bit about your experience, uh, your memories of Hong Kong, um, you know, if there were any as a child and now as an adult. Like moving around. Um, <laughs> you know, when I, I talked to my mom uh, before this program to just get a little backgrounder. Mm -hmm. And it was um, one of, I think I, I want to piggyback on Greg's kind of recollection of the Kowloon Walled City. And um, you know, I think my mom told me she used to, you know, she used to live in Diamond Hill, Greg, oh, and yeah. uh, nearby. She, it used to be a two, two bus stop um, to get to the Kowloon Walled City. Wow. Just, just so in the that. six, yeah. And then in the sixties, when she was like a, a teenager, uh, my grandfather would take her there to the Kowloon Walled City for dentist work. Right. Because those were the best deals because it was yeah. unlicensed. Yeah. And, you know, it, so it was, you know, she saw some, some like, what are all the things you've described, like drug, open drug use. Um, there was some, uh, I think adult, adult entertainment right. in there. And um, that's like what she remembered. But for my grand, my, my grandpa, it was like, he went there to actually hang out with a lot of his old friends mm -hmm. because they were all part of like a group um, that kind of was running away from the cultural revolution. Mm. And a lot of the people that, you know, started that, the Kowloon Wild City in, in that era or kind of built it up were, were post-cultural revolution refugees, right? Yeah. So my grandfather, who was actually a cop uh, in Hong Kong, and of course oh. he didn't have oh. to actually police there at the time. So he could just go there and then, you know, it was like perfectly filled with like familiar faces and um yeah and vices and then you know and then my mom could get her dentist some cheap dentist work right right happening. so and so um, i mean do you have any i mean i think your family left before you sort of had memories yeah we weren't in in that hood so much we mm -hmm. were in a different hood by that by that time um so it was more about my mom's kind of early kind of early life where she, they lived nearby and my my grandfather was frequenting the Kellen Wald city to hang out and um so what was my other 
I guess that was my point, I guess. So I didn't have that many memories, but the airport though, <laughs> since Greg was very, you know, uh, kind of obsessed with it. He, he have so many great photos of all the approaches and these like landings that look like they're like Photoshop or collages, right? When you juxtapose, you know, you're playing with space. Sometimes some of your pictures, they look really flat, like on purpose, right? You try to flatten it. So it looks yeah. like it's not even real. Yeah, but, you know, um, I mean, there, you know, there are the, um, the approach took planes basically flying directly towards the walled city. And if, if um, you know the, the Kaitak approach, um, air jets would head for this mountain with a big red and white, orange and white checkerboard on it, and then make that sharp turn, like a 47 degree turn, while still descending over the city. And wow. so the jets would arc past the walled city, and it was an, an amazing sight. I mean, in the walled city itself, people would sit out on the rooftops watching the jets go by, you know. So, I mean, all these features of Hong Kong were completely commonplace and not even remarked about at the time, really. I mean, so much of Hong Kong was just, well, it's everyday stuff. And, um, you know, maybe it takes an outsider to be a bit gobsmacked by it all to kind of go, this is like maybe worth looking at and um you know for me I mean, all this stuff in hong kong at the time in the 80s wasn't really interesting to anybody you know and that's why i guess i kind of photographed it for myself i mean the only kind of things where i saw the hong kong i was interested in whether it's the walled city or just the streets at night were in hong kong gangster films those were the only like the, those directors production designers, cinematographers, those were my only kind of kindred spirits in terms of like making Hong Kong look and feel the way it was. Like people who were more artistically inclined would like go off to Paris or the States to kind of get their, I guess their education, their accreditation. I mean, it was such an outward looking time for education in the arts that's completely changed now and it changed you know with within a generation it's completely different now but yeah. that period you know I, I really feel like Hong Kong didn't appreciate itself certainly the way it does now and you know for me it's interesting how if I if I if I can ask you um you know at, at some point you know you've got Hong Kong memories family memories and pop culture references but at some point you, you had to decide, okay, I'm gonna kind of take the walled city and kind of make it my own, you know? And what, you know, what, what was that process and kind of realizing, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of riff on the walled city now. Um, well, I, I was at the time um, moving into the kind of martial arts mohap uh, genre because I was in a kind of like a guayuku, like horror horror story genre before. And I, I tend to kind of move from genres. So I knew that was already like coming down the pipe. But, um, you know, my decision kind of started off with that scroll, the retainer, like the uh, along the river during the Qingming Festival, which I saw oh. that animated scroll in, in, in Hong Kong. That was in 2010. 2010. Yeah. And I was figuring a way like, be, what is like the opposite of this scene that I'm seeing? This super harmonious city and it's all bucolic and there's like a kid like running over a bridge and everything's like really kind of ideal. And I was like, oh, well, what if I went totally 180 and then dropped a Kellenwald city in my kind of like perverse perversion of it, right? Um, so I, I kind of used it as an avatar, but then, you know, later on, I started, I didn't, my initial idea, I didn't really think about it serving as an avatar for kind of like, um, kind of diasporic experience, like a place that is kind of no place, kind of both British colonial and mainland Chinese, but neither, you know? Um, so I started to feel like an affinity to that. Like it's almost like a portrait. It could, it could, despite it being architectural or structural, it almost serves as like a portrait, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then I was also interested in like 
this idea of lawlessness and anarchy and order because in martial arts fiction, it's kind of like the wild, wild west. And there's these like organically developed codes of conduct and order kind of that's upheld by like outlaws and warriors and heroes and whatnot. So I started seeing this kind of parallel with how the this community in the Kowloon Walled City existed and how they kind of developed their own kind of governing like form of social order without the um, intervention of the government agencies or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's kind of how it all came about. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's really so that, I mean, that's really nice. That kind of you know bucolic harmonious pastoral scene and then this kind of intense urban kind of out there place that was I mean both real and unreal in the sense it's it's I think proven to be a strange springboard um, because of this these ideas coming together I mean one of the essays in the, the book that my co-author and I did we, we have some great writers who contributed essays and one of my favorite um, it's about the walled city being triply neglected so ignored neglected by the Hong Kong government ignored by the British colonial administration and ignored by Beijing which was actually the sovereign of that piece of land I mean the reason the walled city was what it was what what it was was because that tiny piece of land in the middle of urban Kowloon was actually sovereign Chinese territory. It was left out of the, tr the treaty between Britain and um, China that ceded Hong Kong to the Brits. So, I mean, I love that, that notion of it being triply neglected. And indeed, you're right, people had to um, make their own life there and create their own kind of administration or their own sense of kind of harmony without it being imposed. Yeah, and so I wonder, uh, you know, from from Howie, we've heard, you know, dentist and adult entertainment. Um, you know, what what else sort of took place in the Kowloon Walled City that people would like be surprised about? Well, uh, doc, I mean, medical services as well, um, because uh, I mean, it was famous in Hong Kong for its its dentists. So if you were a, a mainland dentist and you arrive in Hong Kong particularly during the Cultural Revolution in the, in the 60s and early 70s, um, if you're gonna practice uh, legitimately, you'd need uh, a license, but because that was Chinese territory, mainland Chinese territory, um, Hong Kong laws didn't apply. And so you could start your dentist um, practice or medical practice and just by word of mouth, if you were good, people came. If you weren't, people wouldn't. So um, it was a pretty, pretty organic in that sense. Um, but other other things going on there, a lot of um, meat and food production. And again, there's no health and safety inspections or standards that are imposed or followed. Um, but um, yeah, meat, meat factories, wow. uh, fish ball, um, factories, um, a lot of small, very low level um, plastic factories, metal workshops, um, that kind of thing. Where I mean, it was the cheapest place to kind of set up shop in Hong Kong to start your business. So mm -hmm. if you had a, a little seed money uh, and it doesn't matter where you are, or what it looks like, well, the city wasn't a bad bet, you know? Yeah. And so Howie, I wonder about like thinking about your depiction in Retainers of Anarchy, the, I mean, monumental, huge uh, five channel video. Um, uh, some of the cells, some of the, the units we'll say in your fictional depiction of the Calvin Wald City, what are some that really, um, I don't know, like please you the most? Uh. Well, well, I, you know, like, um... I looked, you know, Greg's book, City of Darkness. Oh, City um, of Darkness. Uh, I forgot what the architect's uh, named, Greg. Uh, Ian, Ian Lambold. Ian Lambold, yeah. So that book is pretty essential in my research because Greg was one of the first people that to really put a, create a lot of stunning 
engaging images documenting that space. Um, so that was kind of important. Like in my work and my depiction of Kowloon Walled City, I, I tend to conflate these kind of mundane industrial kind of businesses with, um, with these martial arts heroes. So in a way I'm, tr you know, like I have a figure who looks like a swordsman and he's bouncing on a bamboo pole kneading dough for a very signature Hong Kong uh, bamboo, bamboo noodle, right? Tuk Sing Min, which is very regional. And that's part of my interest in also this idea of like pres preserving like regional culture. Um, so in a way they're like heroes. I, I use them as avatars or like heroes preserving a local regional culture because we're dealing with these waves of homogenization yeah. um so it's kind of to give a shout out to that but you know to piggyback on um greg's earlier idea about seeing kind of beauty or something interest in like hong kong visual culture like i understand in that period because i think in, in hong kong culture is very like efficient and expedient so it's like oh we'll get it done just get it done and then boom so you, there's not like all this like contemplation, like life paces very fast. So you just want to get things done and move on. Right. So, but now we're, we're under now the current uh, vibe is like, there's a lot of looking back because um, there's a lot of looking back and, and assessing and putting value to all the visual culture that Hong Kong has to offer or had to offer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe in part due to, how quickly it's changing. Um, you know, in that time when you were documenting, Greg, I don't think people locally were concerned about the erasure of the visual culture of the city. No. But now there's like, you know, there's like miniaturized dioramas of like Dai Pai Dons and all this kind of stuff, which, which is like street cart, Josh, food. Yeah. But all this stuff, there's like mailbox, like all this mailbox stuff, like M plus the museum's up and their mandate has this big visual culture arm and they're collect trying to collect like neon lights that are getting taken down and all this kind of stuff. So there's been a big, like, kind of like a wake up call in, in the city about preserving a lot of this um, kind of visual culture that was, I guess, kind of bypassed based on the speed of life. And, and yeah, and so, so I wonder, I mean, that sort of leads into the uh, like the next logical question, I suppose, which is about how um, how newer technologies are being used to um, capture memories uh, or to modify memories from original media. So if we think of, you know, black and white photography and now digital processes, uh, we think about lower fidelity film and video and then you know, high fidelity and animation and so on. I, I wonder, and that's sort of a question to both of you about, you know, photography and film and video and how newer technology is sort of preserving and modifying and playing with um, memory. Whoever wants to tackle that first. I mean, just the, the, the ubiquity of the ability to make a photograph now uh, is has transformed things in in ways I, I can hardly get my head around. Um, there, you know, there there used to be um, uh, a combination of factors keeping people away. You know, the cost of film, the 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 craft of kind of making a picture, um, the the delay between making it and seeing it, and that's all gone now. It's just it's become as ubiquitous as, as talking or writing, you know? Um, so it, it's almost, in, on, on one hand, it's almost unrecognizable and, and yet the same, I mean, looking at something like Instagram where people are kind of discovering the history of photography <laughs> all at once, all together, all at the same time, as well as making new things all together. I mean, it's just this incredible mishmash of stuff that's, mm. you know, I mean, you, you literally don't know what you're going to see when you wake up in the morning, you know. And that's that's pretty different, you know. Um, and, and I mean, just the ability to um, to move things around uh, at at the speed and ease that 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 we can. I mean, I, I don't I don't think that's um, um, 
that that's anything that uh, to, to be to be just um, taken for granted. I mean, it's it's so powerful, and people are, as we see, learning to um, weaponize it as well as to um, you know make art with it. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's just it's 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 a it's this it's this whirlwind that I, I don't know where it is or where it's going. Um, you know, I'm still shooting film, getting it processed, scanning it, and making books. You know, so uh, I, I'm maybe not the right person to talk to about about technology. But yet, at the same time, uh, social media has allowed me to do things I want to do in terms of uh, funding things via Instagram, pre-selling books before they're printed. Uh, allows me to do things that I, I never even thought about until very, very recently. So. Yeah. And I, I wanted to ask you that question. I think I give a w warning about it, but I, I stumbled upon that Instagram page, um, old HK in color. Right. And they use, it's all black and white photographs, but then they use some sort of AI and post processing to, I think, approximate what the palette of the scene was. And it really brings it, it it's strange because it brings it kind of brings you more closer there but Absolutely. then there's all these questions about should history stay as history or is it you know it, like is it I don't know confusing the viewer as to what what it's like you know by um, these I don't know I mean I, I think it maybe it's worth bearing in mind that you know the reason there was black and white photography is that they couldn't figure out how to do color you know so that was that was the default for a long time, and then once color arrived, black and white becomes this other thing, you know, either romantic or um, more uh, representative of an issue rather than uh, 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 a work of art or something commercial. I mean, in, within photography, there was this ridiculous period where serious photographers didn't work in color, you know, which is kind of amazing when you think about it, but um, that that's, you know, that's gone now. And uh, yet, you know, for a time, I mean, filmmakers would do something in black and white to signify their seriousness or, or just their uh, romantic notion of, of what something should be. So I mean, I, I just think that's, you know, we, we, we equate black and white photography with history just because, I mean, color Film wasn't around at that yeah. time. Yeah. So I'm also seeing these um, neural networks. Have you seen these, Greg? I don't think so. They're crazy. They're like 4K. They're up resolution, like old footage, like from like the late 1800s. Oh, but yeah. But it's like 4K and like 60 frames per second. So it's like super smooth and it I, it's just really bonkers. And then... Um, I think when I saw it, it was so strange because it looked, you know, like it looked contemporary, except right. it, it looked like a movie that was in, in, in period production. Right. No, I know what you mean. I saw um, a, a, a World War One, World War One film footage that had that treatment and it's, it's, it's jaw dropping to see it. I mean, it's like you're, you're seeing it for the first time is really powerful because you something it really is something you've never experienced before and like you say it looks like a period drama that's, that's how our brain tries to deal with it and then on the on the kind of meme arm of like image making and photography there's this deep fakes thing right where you slap a face uh on, on another face kind of a thing you ever see those i'm not sure if i have <laughs> oh my god there's a good there's a good deep fake with a a leader a uh, uh, a world leader that's uh -huh. pretty great i'll send that to you privately <laughs> <laughs> yeah there are yeah definitely uh good chop jobs we'll say <laughs> with uh bodies separated from heads and reassembled but that just makes it seem like now it's like you can't trust any image right like when you were working with photo photography greg that's what you got was what you got you know um my, you know, plus some, maybe some lab, a little, some lab work, you know, like treatment and, and processes, but. Yeah. Although, I mean, to be fair, there, there was certainly trick photography. 
Um, air, airbrushing, you know, the, the yeah. Soviets were, and the Chinese. Uh, airbrushing and double and, exposures and, you know, uh, half expo, like exposing separate prints, but onto the same sheet. And uh, it, yeah, it's yeah. just so much easier now and so much more convincing and yeah. forensically so hard to detect. So, yeah. Well, amazing. Um, so I always like to end these, you know, on, on sort of a, because the power plant does focus on contemporary art, what people are doing in the here and now. Um, I wonder, um, Howie, I'll start with you. What are you currently engaged with? Um, I'm as actually- As much I, as you're willing to share. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, you know, I think it, it really goes good with the talk and the program, but um, I'm working on, building, uh, making some new content to be integrated in one of the media works that are at the power plant, Parallax Chambers, the single channel work. Right. That work is going to Hong Kong and being exhibited there late, I think late March, 2021 right. at Daigun. And um, so I'm updating, I'm putting some new, 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 new jewels in there to, to, to beef it up a bit um unfortunately i won't be able to go uh but i think i'm you know cu currently working on that and some other projects um around the city kind of awesome yeah awesome and greg of course um your city of darkness and city of darkness revisited amazing books um but as you mentioned you are still photographing and still uh producing books so as much as you're willing to share, what are you currently working on? Well, I have to say, first I'll say how jealous I am of like artists who like work in their studio, you know, and kind of can do things with, uh, I don't know, a, a pencil and a piece of paper. I kind of, I can scratch down a few like ideas on my to-do list, but I, yeah, at some point the pictures I make, I kind of got to go out the door and, um, and I, I don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining. I'm, um, I, I, I like doing that and I wouldn't have it any other way, but um, a big part of what I've been working on is uh, a, a book that's set in Japan and I've had about halfway through it and um, you know, I'd, I'd intended to spend part of this year there working on it to try to finish it and that's obviously not happening. So that project is kind of <clears throat> suspended. Um, I'm, I'm photographing locally. Um, uh, Kind of around where I live. I live just a little bit outside of Vancouver in a, a city called Surrey, which is um, when I was growing up, it was kind of like farms and I don't know. Um, um, that was about it. And, and now, a lot like Surrey in England. <laughs> Uh, very different. Yeah, it's not it's not as as, as Tony as um, <laughs> um, but uh, but I like it because you know it, it's in a way it's all new for me. So and it's got kind of the residue of what Vancouver used to be in terms of like the scruffiness, you know, at the edges, you know, level crossing rail lines, you know, streets that dead end at railway tracks and <laughs> vacant lots that are overgrown and you know big trees in the middle of nowhere in the city that haven't been cut down yet. So it's kind of got a, a kind of a messiness and a rawness around the river, the bridges that I like, you know. Um, so I'm kind of photographing that kind of thing. I mean, a lot of my early Vancouver photographs before I left, you know, pictures from the 70s, they have that kind of feel of Vancouver as a port town at the end of the railway, you know, before it became, um, a real estate investment destination and a, an urban resort, you know, and, you know, no tourists come out here, you know, so it's kind of, it's kind of normal. And I, I kind of like that. And um, so I'm quite happy to be kind of photographing this area where I'm living and, you know, the, the, the COVID lack of uh, uh, diversions has meant I'm spending more time in the archive than I normally would. So I'm digging out stuff I haven't looked at in 30 years and okay. finding a few nuggets and that's, that's fun, so. Nice. Well, thank you both so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, I think, you know, you both bring such interesting perspective on uh, the Kowloon Walled City in particular, 
Um, and, uh, and so for those who are able, uh, when the power plant reopens, please come on down and experience uh, Howie's work. Um, Retainers of Anarchy, I will say blows you away, uh, especially as you're watching and you hear the jet plane coming in, as it were, to the airport. Um, and, uh, and please check out, uh, check out Howie's website, uh, check out Greg's website, uh, they're both online. Uh, and again, uh, fieldtrip.art and thepowerplant.org. Uh, so on that note, have a great evening and uh, we'll catch everyone for our next field trip program. Okay, great. Nice seeing you guys. Thanks so much. Nice see you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.